Rachel, let me start with you. What, what do the off-year election results tell you about where the country is right now? Yeah, it's something else that's not BS, Jonathan, let me tell you. I understand people were freaking out badly about those polls that came out over the weekend, and I've spent a lot of pen and ink trying to explain to people that polling now really is measuring latent partisanship. What matters is these hard data points. And for, throughout 2023, in special elections, Democrats haven't just been overperforming. They've been really overperforming. And so this Tuesday election cycle, for me, was the main bellwether I needed to see to understand whether Democrats would come into 2024 advantaged or disadvantaged. Because no matter what, it's going to be a very tight outcome in that presidential election. Election, no matter who the nominees are. So, you know, with Tuesday coming into the books now, I'm able to tell people how positive I feel the Democratic strategy is right. We're showing, um, you know, victories through 2022 and 2023, and it's on to 2024 with more road rage. And, you know, Joan, you wrote that Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin was the biggest loser Monday night. I think I have a, a, an idea why, but tell me more. Well, Glenn Youngkin, first of all, scared a lot of Democrats. People didn't necessarily think he would win in 2021, uh, but he did. And he did it by wearing that nice fleece vest and coming across as a nice suburban dad who just thought maybe schools had gone too far in certain areas. He was a moderate. He didn't talk about abortion. Donald Trump endorsed him, but he somehow found a way to keep Donald Trump out of Virginia. Uh, and so he seemed to herald this suburban comeback for Republicans. And then he made the crucial mistake of telling us where he stands on, on some issues, uh, running on a 15-week abortion ban, super unpopular, and also his, his meddling in the schools uh, and, and trying to change curriculum, wipe out teaching about race, uh, change teaching about gender, harass transgender students. Those things were not what people voted for in 2021. I think coming out of COVID, parents were kind of pissed off. They didn't, they thought the school stayed closed too long, et cetera. But he interpreted that as a mandate for his private hardline views. And he put himself on the ballot. He wasn't on the ballot. He spent at least $15 million, probably more, to elect Republicans, and he failed. And so he made it kind of a referendum on him, and I don't know where he goes, because, as you all know, Virginia has a one-term limit for the governor. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not running for president. He's not running for reelection. We'll see. And, you know, Tara, your Republicans got to beat down over the abortion issue, but there's a lot of video of Donald Trump taking credit for overturning Roe v. Wade. There's no way for Republicans up and down the ballot to run away from the issue in 2024, is there? No. Uh, they made this bed. Now they have to lay in it. And it's a loser bed, because every single major election since Dobbs has been overturned, Republicans have lost. It's obvious that they're out of step with the American people on this issue. It's an extremist position. This is what the MAGA extremists wanted. The Republican Party allowed themselves to be taken over by these people. And so the American people so far in the elections that we've had since Dobbs have demonstrated that they're uninterested in going the way of The Handmaid's Tale. So. Um, I think in 2024, you're going to see, and Trump has already started to do this, he started to moderate on his position on abortion because the people who are running his campaign are smart people this time around, and they recognize this is a huge electoral albatross around his neck. And almost 30 percent of Republican women are pro-choice. So this is a problem for him in those swing states that are that, that will determine this election, Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia, um, Nevada. They know that this is a mobilizing issue, because not only is it about abortion anymore, it's about individual freedom and the government coming in and telling women how to uh, make decisions about their own bodies. And last time I checked, Lack of, you know, uh, less government interference in everyday individual lives was supposed to be a Republican position. How do they square that? They can't. So as long as the Donald Trump, it doesn't really matter who their nominee is. We all know it's going to be Donald Trump. But as long as they have uh, a MAGA Speaker of the House who who seems to believe in national abortion bans and is a complete um, a lunatic on a lot of these social issues, this is a cudgel that Democrats can use because it happens to be true 
that these people are extremists and want to take individual rights away, particularly from women. That is a losing election argument. And, and speaking of Speaker Mike Johnson, later today we're going to see what his big plan is for uh, CR, potentially, you know, hopefully, maybe not have the government shut down on November 17th or November 18th, but but we'll see. You know, Rachel, can you please, and I'm going to keep coming back to this New York Times Siena poll <laughs> throughout this, this conversation, but can you please explain the discrepancy between the polls and how they set Democrats' hair on fire. They, they spell bad news for the Democrats, especially when it's, you know, questions about, you know, do you support the president and should he run and all of that. And yet when voters go into the voting booth, they end up voting for people or for issues that, the, that Democrats writ large, and the president in particular, support and have been pushing. What's, where's the disconnect? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm happy to fill that in, and it gives me an opportunity to shamelessly plug my new book that's coming out in February, because that <laughs> what it what it starts off doing is getting people who watch the Saturday show and my friends and everyone on Twitter to understand that we are like unicorns when it comes to our political reservoir of knowledge. Average Americans have none of this reservoir. And right now, average Americans are paying zero, zero attention to the presidential election. So what we're capturing right now in polling and have been capturing is the continued ill-advised conversations from people like Dean Phillips about potentially having a different nominee is some of that desire, right? If I if I call a person that knows very little about politics and I'm like, hey, do you want the old guy that you you know kind of don't like already? Because he nobody ever meets the standards of of getting stuff done in our system. It's not a system of getting stuff done. It's a system of gumming up the works so that always depresses people. And we're capturing a lot of that like imaginary world where I, I take Biden and I replace him with my nominee of choice. You know, it could be Whitmer, it could be Buttigieg. The point is there isn't one nominee of choice. So what I would tell Democrats is no matter what you see in the polls now, what you would be seeing under a competitive Democratic primary would probably be worse because the more that this low info electorate sees of the Republican Party's extremism, the better it will be for us electorally. And it, and it is a hard pill to swallow when I tell uh, clients and candidates, hey, voters are just not that into you, okay? <laughs> but they're not. They're really not. And, and they won't. we won't be able to get really good public opinion out of this cycle, I don't think, until after Labor Day.